Hello and welcome to The Print. We have with us senior BJP leader and Lok Sabha MP from Kindarpara, Bejent Panda. Welcome to The Print, sir. He will be speaking to us on a host of issues related to politics as well as foreign uh, affairs. Well, to begin with, uh, you know, we, we, you were the Uttar Pradesh in charge. And the situation currently is that we see the Deputy Chief Minister boycotting cabinet meeting. We see the Deputy Chief Minister, you know, passing jives at the current Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath. So as a senior leader, how do you look at the current situation in Uttar Pradesh considering, you know, the kind of results uh, we saw in 2024 Lok Sabha elections? You know, I had been involved in the, the party management in UP hmm. in the months of February and March. And then, of course, I had to move to Orissa for my own election. I think what you are uh, mentioning is vastly exaggerated. And okay. uh, many sections would like to play up uh, small instances where there is a coordination issue as if it is some kind of uh, a major mm. development. So that's not the fact at all. Uh, the fact is that the double engine government in UP uh, has delivered. Right. There is a, there's a tremendous transformation in the law and order situation in the state. Uh, it has gone from being a complete out of control situation with uh, kidnappings, land grabbing, murders into a place today where uh, uh, women, uh, anybody actually can walk around freely without fear. Uh, it's also attracting a lot of investment. The double engine government you know, the national government headed by Prime Minister Modi, the state government headed by uh, Yogi Ji is delivering to the aspirations of the people. Uh, the election results are a different matter. We can talk about that separately. But uh, we shouldn't get caught up in uh, these kind of So there's no friction. And, you know, uh, this is vastly exaggerated. And there's nothing really to it. But what exactly, you know, went wrong as far as Uttar Pradesh is concerned? You know, you were the in charge, then you were sent to contest elections in Odisha. You were, I mean, you as the in charge, you were not replaced. You know, so in a way, elections happened in Uttar Pradesh without, uh, uh, so to say, an election in charge. So what exactly went wrong as far as Uttar Pradesh is concerned? Well, look, all the surveys, all the feedback when I was involved in uh, till March was, were very, very positive. Hmm. And uh, it's not a fact that uh, I was not replaced. Uh, hmm. Three co-in charges were appointed when I moved to Orissa. You know, let's be frank about one thing. Hmm. The opposition ran a propaganda hmm. campaign, which was a canard, that uh, this sweep for the BJP NDA would be misused for, uh, for removing reservations, which is completely wrong. I mean, this is an issue that has been addressed time and again. Yeah. But uh, somehow, I think perhaps with the help of some sections in the media, uh, I think for various other reasons, they successfully ran that campaign. And I think that is something that we need to introspect and decide how to deal with such massive false propaganda, which uh, uh, sort of preys on the insecurities of people. Yeah. There are sections of society which have been... Uh, uh, neglected for a very long time in history. The modern Indian constitution provides them the ability to overcome those historical disadvantages. The BJP is fully committed to that, has been reiterated time and again by Prime Minister Modi, by Home Minister Amit Shah ji, by our party president Nadda ji and others. So uh, we will uh, figure out ways of dealing with such false propaganda which have an effect on uh, on campaign. Well, you mentioned propaganda. So, you know, I also wanted to ask you that, you know, there was this entire slogan of Char So Par, you know, more than 400 seats, but we saw that, you know, the tally got reduced substantially. Uh, if it was, uh, you know, as you said, the propaganda, why was the BJP not able to realize it and counter it, you know, because they were raising the issue of, let's say, a reservation or caste census. Uh, why did the party not realize the importance of that issue? Because a lot of people are saying that it was resonating on ground. I see, I don't agree with you there yeah. because every source that was reporting on the elections around the country was reporting that it was massively in favor of Prime Minister Modi's leadership and the BJP. And in fact, it has turned out to be the case because it's a historic third term for Prime Minister Modi and mm. the pre-election NDA alliance got elected. Mm. 
Mm. Now, in terms of the the numbers that we got in the BJP, look, today, in retrospect, in hindsight, it's very easy to make these assessments. Please go back and look at the assessments of your own colleagues. Look at the assessments of other major media platforms. Look at the assessments of various survey organizations. Mm. Look at the assessments of all pundits, including most pundits in the opposition. And they were all saying the same thing. Uh, in in the up uh, in up there was a massive uh, mood in favor of uh, uh, of uh, the modi government uh, the the high point of uh, the build up to the campaign was the ram mandir mm. inauguration and as i said i don't think anybody picked up on this uh, uh, i suppose you you know this this uh, propaganda against us was like a guerrilla tactic. It was suddenly sprung by some sections of the opposition, which continue to try and play up these, try to create divisions in society. Yes. And it suddenly sprung up. And I don't agree that it was widely expected by people. I don't think most people widely expected that a false propaganda would get such traction. So yes, we will figure out ways and means of how to counter false propaganda going forward. But in retrospect, it's easy to say, okay, this was the case or that was the case. That was not the situation. Uh, many also say or believe that, you know, the Hindutva politics of the BJP, somehow that also did not get traction in 2024. And, you know, they cite the example of the Faizabad seat where, you know, you have the Ayodhya the assembly uh, the constituency. As you also pointed out, the Ram Mandir inauguration took place. So, and at the same time, if you look at uh, Varanasi uh, seat, uh, PM's uh, winning margin also got reduced considerably. So, a lot of people say this Hindutva push of the BJP, that's also a lesson for the party. You know, I think, again, in the questions you have just raised, there hmm. is a great deal of misunderstanding and some people misrepresent it. Hmm. What is the BJP actually? When you talk about the BJP's policies, I encourage your viewers and readers to actually read the BJP's constitution. So when you say BJP's Hindutva politics, read the constitution of the BJP. Second, I also ask and urge your viewers and readers to look at the BJP's governance slogan of Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas and Sabka Prayas. And I, I challenge your readers and your viewers to find something. Is there any case of the BJP NDA government discriminating against anybody of any religion? There is not a single example. You know, huge amounts, lakhs of crores of rupees are spent on different Modi government yojanas throughout the country, whether it is providing piped water to every house, whether it is providing housing to the underprivileged. Uh, I can go on and on. There is not a single example of anybody being discriminated against by religion. So these are canards. These are propaganda that need to be countered. And media should not fall into projecting the false narratives that some people in the opposition try to uh, promote about the BJP. And like I said, we are, we are assessing and we are going to figure out ways of how to more effectively counter such canards and propaganda. You know, but the opposition also also pointing to the anti-Muslim pitch uh, of the government as well as the party. And they're talking about, you know, in, in issues related to policy related uh, uh, decisions that are being taken, let's say, by Assam on Love Jihad or Land Jihad or the Waqf Board uh, amendments that are being uh, sought. And they're saying there is this sudden thrust on, you know, sort of what can we call it, the polarizing, uh, you know, techniques or polarizing politics. Is, is that correct? Is it because of uh, the drubbing that the party received in the 2024 Lok Sabha so elections? Again, again, I will once again appeal to your viewers and to your readers to dissect this question a little bit more. Now, what you just said, anti-Muslim policies. Let's, hmm. let's go That's through That's the this. word opposition on, let has me used. Address it. Let yeah. me address it. Yes, yeah. you're right. Some people hmm. in the opposition are making these fake allegations. So, look at the fact. When we reformed triple talaq, hmm. many of these people said this is anti-Muslim. But the reality is Islamic countries themselves have uh, reformed triple talaq rules. And in India, the constitution guarantees equality to every citizen. Why should Muslim women be deprived of equal status? as women of any other religion. That was also being, uh, be, being uh, falsely branded as anti-Muslim. Now, secondly, uh, you talk about um, uh, Assam's laws. Mm. Now, 
one of the forefront reforms in the law that is being done in Assam is the crackdown on child marriage. Now, some people are portraying that as anti-Muslim. Mm. Now, that should not be the perspective to look at it. Is any Indian citizen in favor of underage marriage? We have outlawed it by law for decades. And every section of society, whether they are Muslim or Christian or Hindu or Jain, have to abide by it. And people should not see it in that light. It's, it's a very horrible way of misrepresenting uh, what is a social need. Uh, you know, for example, the government has succeeded in uh, the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao campaign. You can see the gender ratio changing dramatically in many states. Thank goodness that nobody has tried to portray that as against some kind of religion. Uh, but every single one of these examples is a question of the government implementing the principles enshrined in our constitution and some people trying to misrepresent that as anti-somebody or uh, anti-some group. Let's take the work, work uh, uh, reforms that are being discussed about. Look, as was pointed out by Minority Affairs Minister uh, Kiran Rijuju in mm -hmm. Parliament yesterday, now for decades, various committees set up by governments, including by Congress government, including by UPA government, have made these recommendations. They have put it on the record that the Waqf board is misused. It is grabbed, its control has been grabbed by a small section of people and the vast majority of the Muslim population are deprived of the benefits of the Waqf properties. Massive amount of siphoning off of the income takes place. Such huge properties get such a small income, it's being siphoned off. The destitute women and children uh, of Muslim society who should be benefiting from Waqf properties are in fact being deprived of it. And in reality, these changes that we are implementing have been recommended by experts appointed by all kinds of uh, parties which are today in the opposition. So it's a completely fake narrative to portray it somehow as anti-Muslim. In fact, it is for the emancipation of the underprivileged and deprived Muslim citizens. But Mr. Asasuddin Ovesi and other opposition leaders have also cited certain uh, you know, issues uh, with the amendments. For instance, why would you know, people not belonging to a certain uh, religion, why would they be members of the, let's say... All the, of these issues have been addressed. Hmm. All of these issues have been addressed very clearly. And, you know, as Rijuju ji pointed out yesterday, there had been a, an existing paradigm where minority meant something very hmm. specific, which was very peculiar. Now, uh, Kiran Rijuju ji himself is a minority. Hmm. He is a Buddhist. Hmm. And he is bringing about these reforms, which affect a large section of Islamic society. Now, is anybody going to argue that why is, are these changes not being proposed by somebody who belongs to that faith? You know, these are very silly arguments. Uh, the BJP, and you know, you, you talked about uh, these policies as if it is something suddenly that has come out of the uh, cupboard. Now, these are policies that the BJP has been espousing for decades because we believe in equality of all citizens, justice to all, appeasement of none. And this does not sit well with some people who have uh, grabbed control of minority institutions and uh, establishments to, uh, you know, to try and control their narrative, to try and control them as vote banks. We don't see them as vote banks. We see them as citizens. A number of opposition leaders have also said that, you know, the fact that the bill was tabled, but it had to be referred to the committee and it could not be passed shows that the BGP does not have the kind of support of its allies the way it's you know it would a, it's have. Utter a nonsense. Again, I will I will appeal that you know the media should not play to the gallery in the same way that some opposition sections do. Right from the beginning, we made it very clear that we are perfectly happy to send it to a joint parliamentary committee. Please, if you look at the parliamentary proceedings yesterday, uh, and I know you cover parliament. I was sitting there hmm. and watching. Right from the beginning, even as opposition members were saying that, you know, if you must introduce it, please send it to JPC. Right from the beginning, we kept yeah. saying, yes, we are perfectly happy. It was not under compulsion. We are perfectly happy. This is a momentous bill. Now, uh, ex extensive consultations have taken place, as uh, the minister pointed out, for 10 years. Consultations all across the country. Consultations to a wide variety 
of representatives of Muslim society, hmm. consultations of different, you know, there are sections of Muslim society who have been particularly underprivileged and discriminated against under th uh, by those who have controlled the waqf boards, uh, such as the Bohras, uh, such as the Ahmadiyas, uh, such as the Pasmandas. And uh, consultation took place widely. Uh, we have absolutely no issue that such a momentous bill should have deep scrutiny by a joint parliamentary committee. So it's, you know, when they don't get what they want, when we are very happy to refer it to a committee and have detailed scrutiny, then they try to spin it and some people in media play along by saying, oh, you are under compulsion. No, no, not under any compulsion whatsoever. Right from the beginning, our stand was extremely clear that we are perfectly happy for it to go to committee because such a momentous bill deserves thorough scrutiny. So you're saying the timing is not suspect as the opposition is saying you have elections in Haryana, Maharashtra and which is why, you know, there's so much discussion on this. So we have elections every three months in India. Hmm. Uh, uh, we have had elections in Haryana before and Maharashtra before. And this bill has required extensive consultation. And that is why it took time. If it had been hurriedly introduced in 2015 or 17 or even 21, uh, people would have said that you haven't had enough consultation. Proof of all the consultation was given. Now, if you say that don't introduce this bill until the Haryana and Maharashtra election takes place, three months after that, there will be other elections. Right. So, uh, that's a completely uh, silly argument to make. You were also the in charge of Delhi and you know, we saw how the court made very strong observation while giving granting bail to AAP leader Mani Sisodia. Uh, how do you think this is going to sort of play out and what does it mean for the Amani party as well as for the BJP with the elections due next year? I think uh, you are missing out the hmm. forest for the trees. Hmm. Uh, let's not go by what comments any bench makes. Let's go by the rulings that a bench makes. And the fact that uh, month after month after month, he kept hmm. getting denied bail because there is prima facie evidence. Because there is a money trail, because the Delhi government authority was misused to allow liquor shops in prohibited areas in front of Gurdwaras, near schools, uh, because witnesses have come out with uh, uh, sworn statements, uh, giving evidence of huge amounts of money transactions. For all these reasons, uh, he was denied bail for a very long time. Who denied him bail? Not the government, not the BJP party. It's the court that kept denying bail because there is prima facie evidence. Now, some people, uh, especially in the Ahmadmi party, have a habit of trying to claim victory from a, from a loss. The reality is uh, every Indian citizen has to go through the same standards of law. You don't get special privileges because you are from a political party. You don't get special privileges because you are a minister or a... Uh, or an MLA or an MP. So, uh, and to try and claim victory for just, and the bail has very stringent conditions attached. He has to report to police every week. Uh, if, if he thinks he should be proud of that, well, more power to him. But I think the people of Delhi have figured out what he and his party stand for. But what about the party's strategy as far as uh, the... So, let's look, the let's look at the strategy. Let's look at the strategy. Now, at the national level, in the Lok Sabha elections, we have once again, for the mm. third time in a row, won all seven seats. Now, what is most important is, this time, unlike earlier two elections in the last decade, the opposition was united. Aam Admi Party and Congress Party, who had sworn never to be allies, they in fact uh, became allies. You know, they've gone against sworn statements on TV that they would not ally. Hmm. And so, against a united opposition, BJP got about 55% of the vote share. Now, this is a very significant fact that keeps getting missed out on. Uh, if you look at our vote share in the state elections and in local elections, our vote share has increased steadily over the last decade. In election after election after election, our vote share has kept increasing. So, I'm very confident that the Delhi BJP team, which is very energetic, very motivated, will pull off a victory in the assembly elections when they come up in a few months. Before I move on to Bangladesh, uh, just one more question on 
Odisha. You know, a lot of people were not expecting the BJP to do as well as it has. You know, now the the BJP is in part there. What do you think? I mean, where was right as far as Odisha is concerned? Because across the country we saw the tally coming down, but in Odisha it was the complete opposite. So Neelam ji, I think it is only fair that you should inform your viewers that in many conversations over the last few years, I have repeatedly told <laughs> yes. you, I have repeatedly told you that we are going to sweep Odisha, yes, and that we are going to form the government in Odisha. I think uh, in Delhi there are uh, people who. Don't understand the nuances hmm. in uh, uh, in a place like Odisha, and uh, they get carried away by a certain kind of reportage which emanates from media management of those who were in power there for a long time. The reality on the ground was very different. Uh, you saw in Odisha uh, one of the highest increases of crimes against women and children in the last decade. This is reported. Hmm. This, these are stats from the Crime Bureau and reported by major media. Uh, you saw a massive anti-incumbency for a government which had been there for a very long time. You saw a reality where uh, the person who had been repeatedly elected five times as the chief minister of Odisha, he was playing. Uh, he began to play a uh, go into the background, and a non-local, a non-politician uh, who had been controlling his party and government came out into the forefront and started claiming to be a leader of the Odias. That was not acceptable. This was obvious to anybody. The original popularity of the BJD had been when it was formed as in alliance with the BJP 24 years ago, 27 years ago now. Uh, over the last uh, more than a decade, they had been uh, managing through money power, muscle power, intimidation, and the ground reports from across Odisha were that the people were ready for a change. In fact, I'll point something else out. Yeah. If you turn the clock back to January, February of this year, some people in the media started reporting that there might be an alliance. Right. Now, this was not the case. This was not being discussed. But this was again one of those propaganda narratives uh, to try and confuse the voters. But you saw the kind of reaction, not just BJP karyakartas, but millions of average citizens in Odisha rose up. Almost in arms, protesting, saying that they wanted nothing to do with that kind of thinking. They wanted to support the BJP to come into government, and so uh, we we fought a very motivated campaign, very focused and assertive, and uh, we won the confidence of the people. Yeah, and you also won your seat, <laughs> Kindalpara. No, that's that's yeah. also very. It's a apart from being personally very satisfying for me. Mm. Uh, Kendra Pada is arguably the toughest seat in Odisha mm. because it has, for decades, only been won by the Janata Parivar, Biju Janata Dal. Before that, Janata Dal. Before that, mm. Janata Party. Before that, Socialists. So we had never won this seat before. Uh, it's sort of the equivalent of Raiburli in Uttar <laughs> Pradesh. Okay. So it was historic. But Prime Minister Modi's popularity, uh, combined with our party's coordinated teamwork. And all the effort I have made over the decades to stay connected with the people of Kendra Pada, it all helped. Well, you know, there's a lot of debate and discussion over the sort of fallout of Bangladesh turmoil, and you know, especially in terms of the refugees. So, what can India do? Do you think India can give shelter to so many refugees? You know, who are like uh, sort of queuing up to just enter India? Look, we have seen this situation before, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why. We had this crisis in 1971 when, uh, 70, 71 when 10 million refugees came yes. in. This is a big challenge to India. Now we are still a developing country. Mm. Yes, it is true that we have been the fastest growing large economy under Prime Minister Modi for last several years. Yes, it is true that the rest of the world looks at India as uh, one of the major economic engines when the rest of the world has not been doing so well. But despite all that, we are just at the beginnings of a middle income uh, story. And the roadmap and the vision which the Prime Minister has uh, shown us uh, is for a Vikshit Bharat by 2047, 100 years of independence. And for us to be able to absorb large number of refugees is not feasible. It's not. It's not easy for us because we still have, mm. although we have pulled 800 million people out of poverty, mm. we still have to go quite 
uh, uh, you know, we have a road ahead of us to go on terms of development. So it's a huge challenge. And you know, what has happened in Bangladesh is a matter of concern because it destabilizes the neighborhood. We have had a very unstable neighbor to the West who has been involved in state-sponsored terrorism. Bangladesh had been a story where we had made progress, where we had healed some of the wounds of partition, uh, where we had come to an agreement on the land borders, where we were, uh, we have made a lot of progress in reconnecting the infrastructure such as railways and uh, electricity. Mm. Uh, you know, South Asia remains uh, very low in mm. terms of intra-regional trade and commerce, which really helps build up uh, regions and every nation's uh, standard of living. Now, we see the kind of things that have been happening in Bangladesh. Mm. You know, I'm from Odisha yeah. and you saw some of the pictures where temples were vandalized and among the uh, murtis that were uh, disrespected and vandalized were of uh, Mahaprabhu Jagannath, Palabhadra and Subhadra, which are the uh, deities of uh, the Jagannath temple in Puri, which is so important to us, is very, very disturbing for us. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's being handled maturely. Uh, both our Prime Minister and Foreign Minister have taken a very cautious but friendly stance towards the interim government which has come in in mm. Bangladesh under uh, Mohammed Yunus Ji. So, uh, we have to work uh, carefully and closely uh, to make sure that this is a situation that evolves in the right direction. Because a number of people within the BJP, uh, including uh, from the government, they are saying that you know it's very difficult to give shelter to these refugees rather than atmosphere should be built in Bangladesh where they feel safe and secure, especially the Hindu community. Look, uh, if you compare uh, pre-independence India hmm. and after partition, the other nations have all seen massive depletion in the percentage of minorities and you've hmm. seen atrocities. Uh, you've seen India give shelter to many. And we have a, we have a commitment right from Gandhiji and uh, from Pandit Nehru right down to our last Prime Minister Manmohan Singh Ji and the current Prime Minister and Home Minister that the minorities who face serious threats to their life and uh, liberty uh, we have provided them a shelter. This is our commitment since partition. Uh, that is why CAA was brought in. And you know, when people were criticizing the CAA, they had seemed to have forgotten mm. partition. They seemed to have forgotten what happened in 1970-71. And we are seeing a deja vu of that. So it's a matter of serious concern. Um, of course, India cannot absorb. Uh, we have a commitment to give shelter to the minorities of these uh, former Indian territories, which are independent countries now. But we can't, you know, there's a limit to how many we can absorb, how many we can provide uh, uh, decent opportunities to. And uh, that is why it is important that we work closely with uh, the world community and work closely with Bangladesh's new government hmm. to ensure that law and order returns as quickly as possible so that people don't feel threatened, they don't feel compulsion to, uh, to try and cross the border illegally. Now we have an interim, interim government in Bangladesh. Uh, how, what is your assessment of Bangladesh? Which way is it heading, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what it means for India? So, of course, Bangladesh is at a very delicate juncture. On the one hand, uh, Muhammad Yunus Ji is very respected uh, in the microfinance world and he seems to be the consensus candidate uh, who has been put in charge of the government there. Right. On the other hand, we have seen that uh, uh, there have been jihadi elements uh, supported by Pakistan who have been uh, creating disturbances in Bangladesh. It's not only in India that Pakistani sponsored terrorism operates. You look at uh, Afghanistan, they have the same situation. You look at Bangladesh, they have the same situation. So that is a matter of concern. Uh, Bangladesh and in fact all, all these nations, they deserve a government which not only provides stability, but it provides fairness, equity and justice to all sections of society. Mm. And uh, uh, I think we'll have to see how things go. They're poised at a very delicate junction. 
uh, I think we should be hopeful that perhaps the interim government will be able to manage the situation and then transition to a more permanent government which will also manage the situation and uh, retain friendly relations with India and not given to some of these uh, uh, elements which have uh, sponsorship from Pakistan and other places. But the fact that Sheikh Hasina has sort of, you know, taken shelter in India, do you think that will also impact India-Bangladesh relation in the days to come? Look, I think uh, one should look at these things very um, dispassionately. When a leader of a nation, you know, considering the history that Bangladesh had, when it uh, liberated itself from Pakistan hmm. and its founding prime minister, Bangabandhu, Mujibur Rahman was murdered and most of his family was wiped out uh, except Sheikh Hasina and, and a little bit others. Considering that, it would have been inhuman for anybody to deny them uh, shelter. Uh, we have seen in some of these countries how their former leaders are um, treated very badly and either hanged or, or assassinated like this. So I think this is an obligation that any country, any civilized, decent country should provide. Because she was a democratically elected leader. It's a different matter that things took a different turn and, uh, and she quit. Uh, so that is one aspect of it. But India has always professed friendship with Bangladesh. And as I mentioned earlier, there had been a lot of progress in terms of dealing with boundary disputes, in terms of dealing with uh, electricity and uh, transport uh, supplies. So, uh, I'm, you know, I think we should keep our fingers crossed that uh, Bangladesh will continue to be a stable country and that we should have friendly relations with it. I know I've taken a lot of your time. Just one last question. You must have seen Salman Khushid's comment that, you know, what has happened in Bangladesh, the neighboring uh, country, you know, similar situation can take place in India. Look, I condemn such statements. I think uh, you can clearly see an element of wishful thinking uh, in some opposition leaders who have made these comments, which is very unfortunate because uh, we are the world's largest democracy in the history of humankind. And uh, we have repeatedly proven again and again that, uh, uh, you know, democracy is very vibrant, has deep roots here. The same people that complain about EVMs, when they win some elections, then they stop complaining. They complain about EVMs, then they win more seats than they were expecting, then they stop complaining about EVMs. We have real democracy. And the way to change a regime in India is through democratic elections. Nobody stops uh, Salman Khurshid from trying to win an election, which I know is very difficult for him. But uh, nobody stops any of these leaders from trying to win elections. That's the way to do it. But to uh, encourage and... Uh, uh, hint at uh, um, at anarchy on the streets uh, is just not a responsible way of behaving like an opposition. And uh, I hope uh, senior opposition leaders take exception to that because the whatever they disagree with us, they can try to get it changed through uh, argument and debate in parliament or appealing to the people of India during elections, but not in supporting anarchy not in supporting violence on the streets. That is never acceptable. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, this is Neelam Pandey reporting with Anisha from New Delhi.